From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. The House Financial Services Committee is about to begin its hearing into the frenzy around GameStop and other so-called meme stocks a couple of weeks ago now. For a preview, we turn to our chief Washington correspondent, Kevin Cirilli. So, Kevin, set the stage for us. What are we expecting? David, we're just moments away from House Financial Services Committee Chairwoman Maxine Waters bringing uh, and convening this hearing on GameStop, on Robinhood, and it is drawing a lot of attention. Now, three things to watch for. First and foremost, does GameStop, do GameStop and Robinhood, do they plan for the long term and try to have a seat at the table of no doubt the regulatory onslaught of questions that they are going to be facing even after the political theater of today ends? Secondly, will some Republicans line with Democrats like freshman Con or like Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who has raised concerns about Citadel in particular. Earlier today, Senator Elizabeth Warren, not on this committee, but she sent a letter to Citadel echoing many of the concerns that AOC and the like have risen with regards to their involvement, which Citadel denies in terms of the hedge, fund, uh, hedge funds uh, and their involvement with Robin Hood. Uh, thirdly, will other Republicans split from those who raise questions about Citadel, and will they raise questions about the timing of shutting down some of these interactions? Uh, I'm going to keep a careful eye on Congressman Trey Hollingsworth. Uh, Trey Hollingsworth, he is a Republican from Indiana. Uh, he is someone who sits on a subcommittee uh, for investor protections, and he is already saying that the focus should remain on GameStop and Citadel and the timing in which regulators have the ability to shut these things down rather than uh, Citadel and their involvement here. David? Okay, thank you so much for the report from Kevin Cirilli, our chief Washington correspondent, who will be up there throughout the entire hearing as we bring pieces of it to you right here on Bloomberg. To take us through some of the regulatory options that are available to deal with the Robin Hood phenomenon, we welcome now Norm Champ. He's a partner at Kirkland & Ellis. Mr. Champ earlier serves as director of the SEC Division of Investment Management, and he is also the author of Mastering Money. So, Mr. Champ, thank you so much for joining us. I, I, it's Obviously, it's important what Congress has to say, what they look into. A lot of that's oversight. Uh, the possibility of legislation seems probably remote, where the rubber meets the road is at the SEC. How's the SEC looking at this? So you're absolutely right. Congress in this, with these types of hearings, right, Congress has the ability to put pressure on the SEC. What are you going to do about this? What are, you know, what steps are you going to take? I agree with you. I think legislation unlikely. So what's the SEC thinking about? I would put it in a couple buckets. I think one side is do we need more disclosure about kind of the mechanics of shorting and whether, in fact, you can have more transparency into how the shorting process works? Now, that would not be revealing the shorts because that's a problem, as we saw with the GameStop situation. But I think they're probably looking at those kind of disclosure and transparency type issues. I think the second piece is thinking about shorting does provide liquidity to our markets. The large mutual funds in our in this country own the majority, you know, more than half of many of the biggest public companies, just because we have half the public companies now that we had 20 years ago. So shorting is a way for those funds to lend out their shares and provide liquidity in the market. It wouldn't otherwise be available. So I think the SEC is probably going to try to carefully balance these pieces, and they don't want to do, the markets are so delicate and so multifaceted they're not going to want to do something to sort of pull one lever that somehow upsets something else in the market. Shorting is not in and of itself a bad thing. And in fact, it provides the ability for investors to buy shares that are otherwise locked up in big, big mutual fund holdings. So, so there is a positive side to shorting. So for our TV audiences, what you're watching here in the split screen is Maxine Waters. She's the chairman of the House Financial Service Committee. She's talking. She's basically setting up the rules of the road, as it were, for the hearing. We're going to be bringing you the question and answer as soon as we get through some of those opening statements. So, Mr. Champ, let's come back to you. One of the questions I have is we've had short selling for a good long time. We've had market volatility for a good long time. We've had stocks shoot up and shoot back down. Is this a, a, a difference of degree or of kind, what we saw with GameStop and Robinhood? I would simply say of degree. And again, shorting can be very healthy for the markets. I think we had a confluence of a couple things, one of which is the long slide of commissions from the six cents per share fixed commissions all the way now to zero. So 
Now you can trade just like you can use social media and all those other things for free. Now you can trade for free. That is a distinct difference from where we've been before. And I think that collided with this social media idea of let's gather around certain stocks and talk about them in a chat room. Now, I also, I'm sure the SEC is going to look hard at whether, was it really just people in a chat room doing all this trading to bid up the name? Or did other traders jump in on that? I, I'm not sure that just a retail chat room is enough to push a stock up as much as we saw. Uh, so I would say just degree and a couple new things, including commission-free trading. I suspect the SEC will look at that piece of it as well. Commissions have declined steadily from the uh, when they were unhooked from mooring you know, to being uh, fixed to now to zero. That's a big market development. I'm sure the SEC is going to study. Well, what does that mean? Is that you know is that part of this? Is that one of the elements? Well, and one of the things that I think is different, at least, is the pay for flow, so-called. I mean, the Robin Hoods of this world, as I understand it, make their money because they don't charge any commissions, as you say. They get paid for the flow from the people who are basically processing the securities. Is it possible that that is actually exacerbating the problem? Should we think about curtailing that? So payment for order flow has also been around for a long time and tends to then route orders into, you know, the big electronic trading firms, the algorithmic trading firms. You know, I think that's also something they'll take a look at. Again, if you're you, all the different pieces that the SEC is going to try to balance here, if retail investors are able to trade for free, potentially it's okay that the order flow is then sold and, and other people can make money from that order flow, right? So again, markets are so multifaceted. There's so many pieces to this. I would be, you know, I'd be surprised if the SEC tried, like, if you take away the order flow point, the payment for order flow point, then do you suddenly, all right, well, now retail investors have to pay commissions. Are we really going to go backwards on that? It seems unlikely. So I think the SEC will try to find a way to bring a little more transparency and clarity to what's happening in the short process, but try not to upset these other pieces. We've had short squeezes over time, many, many times, this one just got much more publicity and obviously got to heights you know, that we hadn't really seen. Remember, too, that short sellers are the ones that pay the ultimate price on these things, right? As they always say, you know, when you buy a stock long, you, know, you have a certain amount of upside, right? When you short a stock, your potential loss is infinity. And we saw that kick into place. So the short sellers have a lot on the line and they do get punished when things go wrong. So it's not clear to me we should change that, right? Because that's the market working. Yeah, so to keep our audience up to speed, we now are hearing from Patrick McHenry, the ranking member of the House Financial Services Committee, as he's making his opening remarks. Again, we'll dip back in as soon as they start asking some questions. So final question here, you referred to transparency and disclosure. Is transparency and disclosure possibly one way out of this? And there are a couple of areas where there's anonymity. One, on the short positions. We, we know we disclose long positions, not short positions. And the other on who's saying what they're saying in these social media chat rooms. We don't necessarily whether they have a dog in the hunt. So on the first point, you can't have the names of actual shorts and who they're being shorted by out in the market because, you know, something like what happened happens, right? So the names of shorts and who holds them will have to be kept confidential. I suspect they might try more transparency around some of these other pieces. For instance, according to press reports, the short interest was over 100%. That's typically done by some synthetic and other you know, borrowing pieces. I could imagine the SEC saying, look, we're going to try to get more clarity around that. And maybe that has to be revealed or it has to be some sort of data. Like, look, this name is 120% short, which means it's shorter than the float, right? So maybe some more disclosure around that point. Um, I don't... Now, the social, the chat rooms... That's a whole other area, right? All sorts of First Amendment and other issues. And then, of course, the social media sites not wanting to reveal the holder, you know, the participants and the holders. Uh, so all sorts of complicated freedom of speech issues with the chat rooms. I think the SEC will focus more on market structure and market rules and potentially more disclosure about how much short interest there is. Are there, in fact, how much of that short interest is actual borrows? So someone borrowed the stock or is it obtained through other synthetic means or other processes in the market? So I, I would expect them to go there. Very hard for the SEC to really 
do much on the social media platforms. It's not really their jurisdiction. Okay, really appreciate you being here. That helped set up this hearing very, very well. That's Norm Champ. He is former director of investment management at the SEC. And now it's time to get a check on the markets with Abigail Doolittle. So Abigail, the markets are not liking what they're seeing so far. They really are not. It's a very risk off tone. It's been building for a number of days, David, even last week when you had lots of mixed action between the major averages. But right now we're looking at the third down day for the NASDAQ. I don't really think that this has anything to do with the GameStop hearing. It has more to do with the fact that we have rates rising and and that causes the whole question of whether or not we're going to see a repricing of risk. Valuations uh, become more expensive. The capital structure becomes more expensive. So we have the NASDAQ down over the last three days, more than 2%. The first time we've seen, again, three down days this year for the NASDAQ since last October. That's when we had all of that selling action. You also have the New York FANG index, the mega caps, the Apples and Netflixes, the Teslas down sharply. A real note is the NASDAQ Golden Dragon Index, which is a basket of Chinese ADRs here in the U.S., as Baidu and Netties, it is down, having its worst day since August, at one point uh, since May, uh, really accelerating the selling action that we saw yesterday, the first down day in 12. And the reason that that matters, again, these are those tech stocks. So it has everything to do with the fact that you have rates rising, the 10-year yield flirting with 1.3%. Folks have been wondering what level on yield and uh, yield curve steepening would cause a pause for stocks. It seems we have it, David, 1.3%, not liked by stock investors. You know, thank you so much to Abigail Dula for that report on the markets. Coming up, we continue to follow the energy crisis as temperatures in Texas begin to rise after days of frigid conditions. We're going to talk with Congressman Chuck Fleischman. He's Republican of Tennessee and House Energy and Water Subcommittee member of the House Appropriations Committee. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. President Biden has approved Oklahoma's request for disaster declaration. This is millions there and throughout the central United States enter their fourth day without power. Blackouts in the Houston area may last a couple more days. This while residents are shivering through sub-freezing temperatures. Also in hard-hit Texas, authorities have taken an extraordinary step. Natural gas sales across state lines are restricted. Some call that a violation of the Constitution. President Biden's about to launch what may be one of his toughest legislative challenges. His immigration reform bill will be unveiled in Congress today. It includes a path to citizenship for 11 million immigrants living illegally in the U.S. and calls for more technology to secure the border with Mexico. Mr. Biden had his first phone call with Israel's Benjamin Netanyahu. They discussed Middle East peace efforts and defense cooperation. President Biden called it a good conversation. The delay in speaking led to speculation he was freezing out the prime minister. Mr. Netanyahu had a close relationship with former President Trump. Facebook has started restricting the sharing of news on its service in Australia. That's the social network's answer to a controversial proposed law that would require tech companies to pay publishers when their articles are posted by users. Google also opposes the law but did strike a deal with Rupert Murdoch's News Corp to pay for stories from the Wall Street Journal and Australian newspapers. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. About a half a million homes and businesses in Texas remain without power today as residents do whatever they can to stay warm and contend with the loss of water as well as heat in many places. Welcome now Republican Representative Chuck Fleischman of Tennessee. Congressman Fleischman serves on the Energy and Water Subcommittee of the House Committee on Appropriations. So, Congressman, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you know energy. Tell us what the phenomenon in Texas right now is telling us about our energy structure here in the United States. Well, I think, David, it's very insightful. First of all, I want to extend my sincere sympathies to our fellow Americans in Texas who are going through this very sad time. Uh, this is uh, something that shows the fragile nature uh, of our um, electric grid, the deliverability. Uh, there's two big issues, as I see it, uh, reliability and diversity. And uh, it shows the need for a future all of the above energy policy, 
but with a strong emphasis on reliability. Uh, we have seen failures across the grid, across the choice of, of uh, generating power, uh, whether it was fossil fuels or green. Uh, it's an all of the above failure in Texas, and it's very, very sad. Yeah, as you say, Congressman, from what I can see, at least, it seems to be all of the above. You can't point a finger at any particular source. At the same time, there are some people saying part of the problem was Texas really handles its energy different from other, some other states. They're more loners, as it were. They don't interact as well, much with the rest of the grid, and they haven't built as much excess capacity in. Uh, is that something that we should be concerned about as a nation when a state the size of Texas goes its own way? It's an interesting question. As we know, our great friends in Texas uh, pride themselves on their independence, and it is a great state. The danger of being independent is that you, you have the upside of being independent on the cost side, but uh, take a look at the great state of Tennessee. We have the Tennessee Valley Authority, which has abundant resources, has connectivity to other areas. So there's a built-in buffer, if you will, to deal with that situation God forbid if it should occur in this part of the nation. Uh, but states need to make their, their own decisions. I think what Texas ought to look at as they go back is to make sure that there is continued diversity and look at things such as their infrastructure. Uh, that's something that I've been involved in talking with Republicans and Democrats about, uh, and, and actually in both houses, to make sure that the infrastructure is in place to deal with situations like we've seen in Texas, but very sad, aberrant weather, uh, and I, my heart goes out to all the, the millions affected in Texas. I want to keep our audience up to speed on that House Financial Services Committee hearing. As we're still in the opening statements, we will bring it to you once they go to question and answer. Congressman Fleischman, uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, let's go to the infrastructure issue specifically. The new Biden administration says once they get past whatever they do on stimulus, they want to have a second round that really invests in infrastructure. What, from your perspective, should we be doing as a country to invest in our energy infrastructure? Well, several things. First of all, protection of the physical assets. We've seen situations before um, that, that, that occur. We saw it in Florida. We saw it actually in, in Nashville, Tennessee, when there was a suicide bomber uh, basically take out a, a facility, and it affected the entire state in terms of communications. So whether it's energy or communications, we've got to, I think, look at not only uh, security on the cyber side, but security on the physical side of the infrastructure, making sure that the facilities that produce the power, distribute the power, are, are properly protected so that we can avoid future misuse. Is that a substantial problem? Because a lot of our power facilities are quite local. I mean, as you know, we had that instance in a fairly small water treatment plant down in Florida where there was a hacker. Now, it turns out that was not a terrorism event, but it could have been. Absolutely. Again, if there is a physical failure, if there is damage done to a facility, clearly it could affect millions of customers and, and, and have tremendous ripple effects. So as we look at a large infrastructure bill, and I hope we go big, we need roads, we need bridges, we need locks and dams. There's no question about that. I think there's a strong bipartisan appetite and strong support from the American people that we should have a good infrastructure bill, but we need to think long and think deep and long term. Uh, what about storage? One of the issues that people raise is that some of the renewables, such as wind, such as solar, are intermittent, as it were. It depends on the weather, among other things. Uh, is there a possibility to really invest as a nation in storage capacity for our energy? I think that is so critically important. And that goes, David, to the reliability factor. Regardless of the source of the generation of power, storage becomes so critically important. That's why I'm so fortunate I represent the Oak Ridge National Laboratory that is working so hard, for example, on that issue, whether it's battery storage, so that we can keep that power when it is generated and then be able to avail ourselves of that as needed. So storage is going to be critically important. We've made great strides as a nation. I mean, battery storage over the past 10 years has become less expensive, but it's still not quite there. There's a tremendous amount of research being done at the national labs. Uh, so we need these public and private endeavors to make sure that we work on storage 
and I think we can get there. Congressman, it's really great having you here today. Thank you for your time. It's Congressman Chuck Fleischman. He's Republican member of the uh, Energy and Water Subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee in the House of Representatives. In the meantime, the hearing is continuing. It's just the opening statements. What we've been seeing there is Vlad Tenef. He's the founder, of course, of Robinhood, who is giving his opening statement. We'll go through the opening statements and then bring you the questions and answers right here on Bloomberg when they begin. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Walmart is our stock of the hour today after forecasting a slowdown in sales and additional spending this year. Here for reporters Abigail Doolittle. The markets don't seem to be liking it, Abigail. Not at all, David. The stock is down 5.2% Walmart. In fact, on pace for its worst day since March 16th of last year. That, of course, was that brutal day of selling that we had within that brief bear market. That's how much investors do not like this, uh, these results from Walmart. And it's not so much the results because the quarter that they just reported Okay, they had missed, missed adjusted earnings a little bit, but comps uh, pretty strong, e-commerce strong. What they don't like is the look ahead for guidance. The profit is expected to decline slightly in the year. The interesting thing, though, David, is if we dig into it, it's dropping for the right reasons if there could be such a case. CapEx is expected to increase to $14 billion because they're spending on automation. They're spending on ways to build out the business. They're having supply chain issues, so that's one of the factors that they're looking to correct. But something else that they're doing, they're increasing the pay for at least uh, more than 400,000 workers to more than $15 per hour. So that seems a as a positive, but investors, again, not liking this because it means that they are going to miss the estimate that the street had been looking at. Another question, though, David, is whether or not this company is just managing well, because that's why we've had stocks performing so well this year uh, as investors, excuse me, executive teams have managed very well, low bars, and then they've beat. So maybe that's what Walmart is doing. But right now, stock feeling a world of pain. Yeah, but by the way, everything old is new again, because I remember about four or five years ago, Walmart came and said, we're going to invest more in our employee base. We're going to invest in dot com and we're going to take down our earnings for a while. Their stock took a real hit and then it came back over time in a very powerful way. So we've seen a version of that before, Abigail, with Walmart. Well, certainly, David, and it seems as though right now that's taking that hit and perhaps over time uh, we'll see yeah. the positive results for the stock and the fundamentals yeah. of the company. Exactly. Thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on Walmart. In the meantime, we are continuing to watch that House Financial Services Committee hearing on GameStop and Robinhood. Right now, Ken Griffin, he is, of course, the founder of Citadel and Citadel Securities. He's giving his opening statement. And this is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We continue to watch that House Financial Services Committee hearing in Washington. And right now we've moved from Kevin Griffin on to Gabe Plotkin of Melvin Capital, who lost, as I recall, a fair amount of money in shorting GameStop. Those are opening statements. We're going to bring you all the questions and answer once they start. But in the meantime, we're going to make a big turn now to China. It poses one of the biggest foreign policy challenges for the new Biden administration with a good deal at stake for the U.S. economy. Just how much is at stake is the subject of a new report from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the Rhodium Group. To take us through the findings, we welcome now Myron Brilliant, U.S. Chamber of Commerce Executive Vice President and Head of International Affairs. Great to have you back with us, Myron. Fascinating report. And I like the way you sort of did it because essentially you said, what if we totally disentangled? What would it do to us? It's not pretty. David, it really isn't. First of all, it's a pleasure to be back on. What we wanted to say was twofold. One, you know, whatever decisions are made by the Biden administration with regard to China, which is the priority, number one, in terms of farm issues, let's make sure it's data-driven. Let's make sure we have an analysis. This is a very important uh, relationship. We're very connected. But we also have huge issues, right? We have national security challenges with China. We have concerns about some of their unfair trade practices, their record on intellectual property. So our report was just trying to give some data-driven analysis to what the relationship is and what's at stake in terms of GDP should we completely try to decouple the relationship, which is not pragmatic and really not practical. Yeah, what I took from your report in part was the number one recommendation you had for the new Biden administration is first get the data. Look at the data and see what they right. tell you. And there are particular areas in, 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 where specifically the United States economy would be damaged. Well, we looked at four sectors, right? We looked at the aerospace sector where there's huge trade and, and investment. We looked at uh, chemicals. We looked at 
semiconductors, another very sensitive area. Uh, and so we wanted to look at very important sectors that are important to our competitiveness uh, and where we need to protect our competitiveness, but where there's also a lot of engagement with China. Uh, so I think we did, it, I think, a very admirable job in showing what the economic impact is of decoupling. But we're recognizing some decoupling is going to happen because we do have national security concerns. We do have IP concerns. We do worry about China's overemphasis of the state sector. These are real issues that the Biden administration is going to grapple with, and we're very much going to be a part of that conversation. Under the Trump administration, we largely focused on trade, really trading goods to a large degree. But one of the things that you point out in your report is it's not just things going between China and the United States. It's people and it's ideas as well. Well, right. I mean, there's no question that the relationship with China is multifaceted. So it's not just about selling more into China. It's not just about the investment in China. It's all of it. And it's also about the people people exchanges. And frankly, increasingly, it's about third country competition, right? We're facing more competition from China now in other markets. And we have to be aware of that and understand what that means. So our report, I think, is one of several reports that the U.S. Chamber has issued over the last few years, frankly, over the last decade, that, you know, both Democratic and Republican administrations have used to help form their policy recommendations or their approach to China. I think this will be a very important contribution to the assessment that the Biden administration makes. And I have already talked to senior government officials about why we did the report. Uh, and we really have emphasized, again, we have a lot of work to do on supply chains. We need to minimize the risk on any one country like China. We need to focus on China's structural needs, uh, the areas that we have talked about for years now that need to be done, including what I've talked about on your show. And we need to hold China accountable, right? The phase one deal was not a perfect deal that the Trump administration put forward, but it needs to be followed through among many other areas. So as far as I can tell thus far, we have not heard the complete policy toward China from the Biden administration. But one thing that's been said since the campaign is we want to enlist our allies, uh, our other trading partners in dealing with China. Uh, how practical is that as a practical matter? Well, David, the first thing we really got to do is get our house in order, right? We got to get a pandemic relief. We got to deal with infrastructure. We got to make sure America is as strong and competitive as possible. So that's the first priority. But no question in dealing with China, we can't see it as just a bilateral issue. We have to enlist and work with the allies. And it's not just Europe. It's Japan, it's Singapore, it's other countries that want to make sure that the rules of the road are followed, that the global trading system works for the benefit of all. And that means holding China accountable in areas where they're falling short. It also means looking forward to addressing the reform of the WTO system so that areas like subsidy practices are addressed. So there is no way to deal with China directly without enlisting allies more effectively. And I think the Biden administration is committed to that. It gets tricky, though, doesn't it, Myron, as a practical matter, because we may be cooperating with those allies. We're also competing with them in a lot of the areas right. that you talk about. And we just, ha we just had the EU come out with statistics that said that now China has replaced the United States as the largest European trading partner. Well, David, uh, that's true. And, of course, China and Europe signed a deal, and China's part of the RCEP uh, arrangement in East Asia. So we have to get our ducks lined up by developing our own trade policy agenda that will reassert America's leadership around the world, building off of some of the things the Trump administration did. It wasn't all wrong, but going further and deeper in some areas. But I have to tell you, you're right about Europe. Uh, there are areas with Europe that we have convergence, but there are also challenges ahead when you're dealing with data privacy and data governance issues, uh, when you're dealing with some of the irritants in the trading relationship, for example, the outstanding Airbus and Boeing dispute that we need to put to rest, the outstanding tariffs around the 232 actions of aluminum and steel. So we've got some work to do with the Europeans. But the goal of working with the Europeans and working with the Japanese and working with the Singaporeans and others uh, and China is the correct one. Uh, so, Myron, let me put you on the spot. You said you're speaking some to the Biden administration. If the Biden administration said to you, OK, where's the low hanging fruit? Give me the place where we could get allies to go with us and we could maybe make progress with China. Where would you point them toward? Well, I think uh, in a couple areas. I think the allies that we talked to, and I just had a great uh, conversation with the executive vice president of the commission, uh, and we talked about three obvious areas. One is on structural issues. I think there's alignment 
uh, that we have to get the subsidy practices, that we have to get SOE reform. So that's one area. I think we have an opportunity on the digital front. I think we can do more on digital trade, working with the Europeans and working with the Japanese. Whether China is part of that uh, framework or not, I think we have to create the right standards and rules around digital trade. And three, market access. I think we have to get alignment uh, with the Europeans around the market access concerns that we have with China's record and, frankly, other countries like India. So I think there are three areas there that I would point to is opportunities uh, for the United States and Europe. But for that to happen, I go back to an earlier point, which is we've got to resolve some of the irritants and impediments in the transatlantic relationship as well. Okay, Myron, as I say, great to have you back with us. It's Myron Brilliant. He's executive vice president and head of international affairs for the United States Chamber of Commerce. To keep you up to speed, we're now hearing from Steve Hoffman, who's the co-founder and head of Reddit, who's uh, having his opening statement to the House Financial Services Committee. Once again, we'll bring you the entire question and answer period as soon as it begins. As we wait for that question and answer period to begin, we welcome now Eric Gordon, who's a professor at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. And also, our, no, I think Chief Washington Correspondent will bring on later. So, uh, uh, Eric, thanks so much for being back with us. Really great to have you here. Give us your sense about what the Congress should be looking for in this hearing. I think what they should be looking at is the real underlying systematic problems that allow the Reddit uh, uh, GameStop thing to happen. You know, this actual incident itself, you know, is it a big deal? Some people lost money, some people made money. But what it gives Congress is a glimpse into some of the plumbing of what's going on into the markets. And, and I think Congress should take advantage of it to think broadly, think big, and not look for who's a bad guy. I, I don't think anybody's going to leave the hearings tarred and feathered. Uh, and, and I hope it isn't that kind of kabuki theater. So, Eric, as you say, listen, some people lose money in the markets. That happens. Was there a threat to the very structure of the markets themselves? Were they ever in danger? No, I don't think we even came close. I, I, I mean, you know, if a few billion dollars is big money to me, maybe to you, to the market, it's nothing. This is not... This is not something we didn't see contagion like we saw in the financial crisis or the long-term capital uh, LTCM thing. Um, so this was this itself wasn't a threat, but it, it certainly revealed some things that uh, maybe Congress hasn't been aware of, and maybe a lot of us weren't were aware of. Well, and that's my question in part, Eric. I asked uh, this of somebody earlier: Is what we saw a difference of degree or of kind? I mean, as a combination, maybe a confluence of technology and uh, no uh, no brokerage-free trading and some other issues, social media, come together and really change the way the market works in ways that we should maybe slow it down? So that's where we should be looking. We should look at these, like, cumulative interaction effects. If you add the social media loudspeaker to commission-free trading to options leverage, I, I mean, you do get potential mayhem. Um, and the fact that we didn't get it this time doesn't mean we won't get it next time. Uh, just to keep our audience up to speed, uh, those who are watching on television, this is the man who appears on Reddit as Hello Kitty, among other things. And his name is Keith Gill. He's giving his opening remarks right now. Again, we're going to come back to question and answer when it occurs. What about the anon anonymity of what's going on here, Eric? I wonder about that on two sides. One is on the short side. Some people have said at least really big companies who are taking big short positions should have to disclose it the way you do on long positions. Other people say maybe the social media people should have to disclose if they've got an interest in the transaction that they're hyping. I think that's an important thing to look at because, you know, we've always had people who've talked their book, but we've generally seen them. You know, Bill Ackman, Carl Icahn, they've never been shy about talking their positions long or short, but we knew who they were, uh, and, and uh, that's quite different than being, you know, Roaring Kitty or Boring Mitty or whoever these people are. And I think the social media loudspeaker uh, in many ways needs to, be, needs to be looked at. And, you know, it's an interesting question. You know, you have to file 13 Ds and 13 Gs if you're long. You have to say, look, I've, I've got a big position and I'm long. Why, why not on the short side? What, what is the problem there? Uh, it seemed to be uh, something that the short sellers could live with. 
I want to apologize to Mr. Gill. I call it Hello Kitty. It, of course, is Roaring Kitty, and that discloses the fact that I have raised small daughters in my day, and so <laughs> I know about Hello Kitty. It's burned in my mind. So, so Eric, let's come back to the question here of the, what happened when, in fact, Robin had to stop trading for a time in GameStop. That clearly was a fail somewhere. Why did they not know that they had to post that money in order to cover the trades? You know, um, I think that's another thing that they could look at. They could look at liquidity requirements. So if you get somebody like Robinhood who's going to you know, put through these many trades, maybe maybe the liquidity requirements need to be uh, – need to be increased so that you don't stop. You don't have these stoppages of trade because stopping stopping the trades is really bad. That adds unnecessary risk to the market. And there was no reason for that to happen other than that Robinhood did not have liquidity on hand. So maybe that's another uh, fruitful area for the uh, government to look at. So, Eric, please stay with us, if you would, for a moment. As Eric Gordon of Michigan's Ross School of Business. I want to bring in our chief Washington correspondent, Kevin Cerulli, so we can all three of us have a conversation. So, Kevin, give us a sense now. We've had some of the opening statements. We have a couple more to go before the question and answer. Have we learned anything yet? No, but it, 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 there is an emerging issue on the T plus two debate uh, that several of the, those who have testified already in their prepared remarks have brought up. And I'm going to be watching to see if, if Republicans, uh, particularly uh, Congressman Trey Hollingsworth of Indiana, gets on board with that. Because a lot of these transactions and a lot of these deals uh, that went through during the timing of this uh, issue uh, really didn't settle until two days after. And the industry would like to see that uh, happen immediately. So that's one area. Uh, Citadel has been uh, uh, is really at the forefront of the hedge fund taking uh, the, a lot of criticism here uh, and look for Democrats over the next couple of hours uh, to really hammer home on the notion of what role hedge fund companies uh, played, if any, they're denying it, uh, in, the, uh, in, in these actions. So, so I'm so del delighted that you raised that two plus two issue. Let's go back to Eric Gordon on that. As I understand that, that is you got to clear that trade. You got to settle the trade within a couple of days. That's the T plus two. It's down from a higher number just uh, several years ago now. I know that Ken Griffin in his opening part said, let's go to T plus one. I believe that the Robin Hood representative said, let's go to T plus zero. Let's just instantaneous clearance. Did, does that address part of the problem, Eric? It addresses some of it. Yes, it does. And, and the T plus two, two days to trade, reminds me of, you know, like Charles Dixon, Dickens and you know, <laughs> eye shades and piles of paper. Um, remember the old, uh, I'm old enough to remember the old backroom crisis where they, they, they couldn't even cross the trade. They had piles of paper, you know, in, in the back rooms of the brokerages. You know, in a day and age where we're trading things in thousandths of a second, um, why does it take two days to settle? It just it, it just seems crazy, but I don't know that that addresses all of the problems. Um, it it certainly takes some of the risk out. It's a convenient way to you know point people in another direction. Don't look at you know other things we don't want you to look at. I, I think it's something that should just be done. It's absolutely feasible. The the securities industry, which spends millions and millions of dollars on supercomputers, can do this. Uh, Jennifer Schulp of the Cato Institute is now giving her opening remarks. Uh, I believe that's the last person, which means we're probably less than five minutes away from the question and answer. But Kevin, Kevin let me ask you about the question of conflict of interest, because it seemed in advance, uh, as you pointed out, some senators were suggesting maybe there's a conflict of interest on the part of Citadel. Yeah, precisely. And in fact, earlier this morning, Senator Elizabeth Warren, the top progressive uh, in the Senate, uh, writing a letter to Citadel CEO and, and urging them to respond with regards to questions uh, for what she is, uh, is suggesting is potential involvement uh, on behalf of Citadel. They are adamantly denying that. We heard that in testimony. Uh, and and to you know, and, and I would just note here uh, that the T plus two issue and and for uh, uh, the CEO uh, to bring that up and to have to bring that up for the for Robin Hood to bring that up is important because it shows that potentially they are taking a different approach from an industry perspective than big tech took when they were called to Capitol Hill over the past couple of years and in fact they're coming armed with what they would like to see policy prescriptions that's a contrast in terms of the strategic advisory that uh, the industry has been advised with in contrast to big tech uh, and then finally that I would note here uh, another specific 
specific area to watch uh, over uh, the next couple of hours is, is going to be this divide in the Republican caucus. When you have Senator Ted Cruz, who, yes, is facing questions for a Cancun trip, but also was supportive of AOC for her criticism, uh, when you have those strange political bedfellows and alliances, will another wing of the Republican Party emerge to back some of the industry perspective? Because the portrayal, and this is the final point I'll make, David, the portrayal from the opening testimony that we've heard over the last uh, half hour or so has really been millions of Americans are out of work, especially low-wage, low-income jobs that are, that are uh, out of work. They're not able to go anywhere. And so they've turned not to advanced financial tech and financial service institutions. They've turned to platforms that they know. They've turned to Reddit. They've turned to Robinhood. And so the argument that the industry is making is why should they be punished? The question is whether or not they can make the case that hedge fund companies weren't taking advantage of their platforms during this conversation to take advantage of those Americans who turned for financial access to, to markets that otherwise they wouldn't be able to get onto or they wouldn't know how to participate. Another great point. We're just moments away now from that question and answer period, which we will go to as soon as it begins. But let's conclude, really, Eric, with that point, which I'll take to be sort of gamification, that you get an app on your phone and it's like playing a video game, except you're investing money, including in things like derivatives. You know, it's it's great fun. It's democratization. I guess we let everybody, if you think that they're playing in a casino, you let everybody go to the casino and win or lose their money. Sometimes I wonder if it's just the old guys resenting that the young guys <laughs> won some money out of their pocket. I am the big, old, bald expert. I charge huge fees, and a bunch of gamer kids fleeced me. But it wouldn't be the first time we've seen that phenomenon, right? Let me ask you, Kevin. I'll put you on the uh, spot because you're a little bit on the different side of the demographic divide, for, demographic divide from uh, Professor Gordon and me. Uh, do you have a sense among your friends that you feel like, boy, this is—it's our time? Why are you trying to keep us out of it? I, you know, I do, and and I think that's a really good point. And the staffers, especially the the, the there, there's a. As a reporter, there's also a, a demographic divide in elected officials. Hmm. And so people on both sides right. of the aisle, whether it's Congressman right. Gottheimer, a Democrat, or Hollingsworth, right. a Republican, right. they're very in tune with this. Okay, Kevin, thank you so very much, our Chief Washington yeah. Correspondent, as well as Eric Gordon, professor at the University of Michigan Ross School of Business. And now we are going to go to Chairwoman Maxine Waters of the House Financial Services Committee. Restricted transactions in certain securities to meet demands coming from your clearinghouse. And yet, on January 28th, you represented uh, to the media that there was no uh, liquidity problem. Isn't it true that being concerned about having enough capital uh, to meet deposit requirements, isn't that a liquidity problem? Or could you just answer yes or no? Chairwoman Waters, I appreciate the opportunity to address that. Just yes or no? We always felt comfortable with our liquidity and the additional capital that Robinhood raised. Please answer yes or no. We always I felt comfortable. Get through my five liquidity. minutes. I don't have time. I just need a yes or no answer. I, I stand by my statement. The additional capital we raised wasn't to meet capital requirements or deposit so requirements. The gentleman, excuse see, me. I'm reclaiming my time. This liquidity problem had real consequences for your customers, but I wonder if they were all that surprised between December 2019 and December 2020, Robinhood customers experienced monetary losses due to system outages. Customer accounts were reportedly compromised. The firm repeatedly failed to testify its best execution obligations, and it misled its customers regarding its revenue sources. It seems retail investors often get a bad deal at Robinhood. Mr. Tanee? Also, uh, while you testified today that, quote, Robinhood's customers benefit greatly from payment for order flow, quote, unquote, in December 2020, the SEC charged Robinhood for not disclosing that it was getting uh, paid to send customer trades to Citadel Securities and other market makers and for not seeking the best terms for its customers' orders. Robinhood provided such inferior trade prices, it cost your customers over $34 million. Is your testimony after Robinhood paid, uh, is it your testimony after Robinhood paid the SEC $65 million to settle those charges? 
that this conflict of interest is in your customer's best interest? Yes or no? Chairwoman Waters, first, let me say regulatory compliance is at the center of everything that we do. We've made mistakes in the past. I'm not claiming that. Could you I'm answer yes or no to that question? So Citadel Securities is an important counterparty. Nobody's denying that. The reason that. Gentlemen, can I answer yes or no? I'm reclaiming my time. Meanwhile, Mr. Griffin, Citadel's role in this event also raises significant questions for policymakers. Citadel Securities pays Robinhood tens of millions of dollars to process trades by Robinhood's customers. This relationship gives Citadel Enterprise key non-public information as to direction and volume of trades by retail investors. Your firm makes use of private exchanges called dark pools and other um, off-exchange trading to trade large sizes without moving the market against you. In fact, at some point last month, 50% of all trades occurred in dark pools or via OTC off exchange trades. Your business strategy is designed intentionally to undermine market transparency and skim profits from companies and other investors. One problem though, Mr. Griffin, is that we don't really know how central your firm has become to the capital markets. Mr. Griffin, does Citadel handle 47% of the US listed retail volume? Please, yes or no. Excuse me, uh, Chairman Waters, what, what percentage? I couldn't hear that number. 47%. So, Chairman Waters, to the best yes, of my knowledge. Yes, I know. Uh, so, the odd, to the best of my knowledge, we handle in excess of roughly 40% of all retail volume. Thank you very much for reclaiming my time. Mr. Griffin, on January 27, the Citadel execute seven point. Four billion shares for retail investors, which would be more trades than the average daily volume of the entire United States equities market in 2019. Yes or no? Uh, Chairman Waters, that was my written and oral testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, and with that, I now recognize the distinguished ranking member, Mr. McHenry, for five minutes for questions. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Tanev, I'm going to come to you first. Uh, I, I just want to get to what happened on that day in January. So let's take a step back here. You get a call in the middle of the night, according to what I've heard uh, you in interviews say, and based off that conversation with your compliance team, you decided to halt the buying of GameStop stock. Uh, people were furious. Um, We'll get into the regulations and the settlement parts of that uh, today. We will get to that. But there's this is what I, I think needs to be answered about your decision. Why did Robinhood restrict the buying but not the selling of GameStop? And why did folks get locked out on the buy side only? Ranking member McHenry, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to address that. Uh, the reason that Robinhood, first of all, let me say Robinhood is always committed to providing access. It's in our name. It's in everything that we do. Uh, the decision to restrict GameStop and other securities was driven purely by deposit and collateral requirements imposed by our clearing houses. So uh, buying, uh, but, but, buying but why, securities. But why? Is, buying securities why pieces are buying. collateral requirements. Selling does not. Moreover, uh, preventing customers from selling is a very difficult and painful experience where customers are unable to access their money. So we don't wanna impose that type of experience on our customers unless we have no other choice. And even though I recognize customers were very upset and disappointed that we had to do this, I imagine it would have been significantly worse if we prevented customers from selling Okay, so let me ask this question. Is payment for order flow legal? Yes, payment for order flow is legal it, and regulated and, and is a common disclosed? industry. And is this disclosed to uh, those users of your app? Yes, payment for order flow is disclosed in multiple places. And moreover, payment okay. for order flow enables 
commission-free trading. And that's why it's become the industry standard model as other brokerages have replicated our model and started offering commission-free trading to their customers as well. Okay, so, so to, that, to, to this greater point of what happened that day and the model that you're using, uh, let's be crystal clear. That decision you made to restrict the buying but not the selling of GameStop was based what was it based on pressure from anyone on the witness panel here today? Not at all. Zero pressure from anyone. It was a collateral depository requirement decision made by our Robinhood Securities president. All right. Fully so let me get into this other question. Let me get in this question. You want to democratize uh, finance. You want to open up uh, uh, Wall Street to retail investors. You say that Robinhood's mission is to democratize finance for all. So let's talk about that. So yes or no, uh, can a Robinhood customer invest in Robinhood the company? Robinhood's currently a private company, so that, that's not possible, no. Uh, and so you, you mean to tell me that the people that use your platform that make you a successful company, and I would say directly contribute to your company's exponential growth and success, they don't get the same access to equity shares as a Robinhood employee or your institutional investors. Is that correct? Currently, that is correct, yes. All right, Ms. Schultz, let me pivot to you. Why is that? Why is, why is it that everyday investors on the Robinhood app